Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to webinar series Sinarku on introduction to CGE for beginners. Uh, my name is Amanda, I will be your moderator for uh, the session uh, today. Uh, hopefully today's seminar uh, will be beneficial for all of us and we will have a fruitful discussion today. And even though our event today starts a bit later than the usual session, uh, I hope the excitement is nothing less uh, than the usual. Okay, uh, I hope uh, my voice uh, is not, uh, I mean, can be heard uh, well, uh, because uh, I hope the internet is stable today. Uh, okay, this event is organized by Ebreda, Universitas Gajah Mada, and LPEM, Universitas Indonesia, GIZ and Ministry of Finance Republic Indonesia. Uh, this is the fifth and the last session uh, for our webinar series, uh, Sinarku on Introduction to CGE for Beginners. In the previous four sessions, we have learned theory and application of CGE and social accounting metrics with Pak Joni from Universitas Indonesia and Pak Pipit from Badan Pusat, Badan Pusat Statistik. Uh, today's session is very special because we have two experts uh, from Germany uh, that join us today. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Helge Brown and Dr. Uh, Zoriana Oleksayuk. Welcome and thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, our topic for today's discussion is application of CGE and integration with micro simulation model. And now uh, let me introduce both of our speakers. Uh, Helge is currently the Managing Director of uh, Ruhr Graduate School in Economics and Executive Office in RWI, uh, Leibniz, uh, sorry, Leibniz Institute for Economic Research, and he obtained his uh, PhD in Economics from uh, Northwestern uh, University in the US with specialization in macroeconomics, econometrics, and labor economics, uh, and Zoriana is researcher uh, from German Development Institute, and some of her works area are in international trade, regional economic integration and disintegration, trade and investment facilitation, foreign direct investment with focus on developing countries, and CGE modeling. She got her PhD in economics from University of Duisburg, Essen. Okay, uh, I thank you for both speakers. Also, I thank you for ladies and gentlemen uh, who have joined uh, our session today. Uh, before we start, I will convey some rules uh, in this webinar. In this webinar. Uh, the first is that the participants are expected to maintain calm and mute the microphone while the speakers are delivering material. And then both speakers will deliver the materials in about 60 to uh, 90 minutes. So both of you can have uh, 60 to 90 minutes. And then a question and answer session will be opened. And the last one is the participant uh, who have question uh, can type their question in the Q&A feature on the screen, or you can use a raise hand feature to uh, ask the question directly uh, and the speakers uh, if you prefer to answer the question uh, in the Q&A in the middle uh, of the presentation uh, you can uh, definitely uh, do that okay so I think that's my uh, that's from me uh, for the opening and then uh, we can begin our seminar so to the speakers uh, the time is yours thank you Thank you very much. Should I start, uh, Hager, or do you want yes, to start? Yes, I think. No, that's great if you start, Sayana. <laughs> okay. For, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's a long time uh, for me that I have been doing something like that uh, since I'm away from the university, no teaching that much, only <laughs> in our um, institute's graduate, um, postgraduate course. So. Um, I'm happy to do that, and um, I will share the presentation. I hope you have received it already, but I will definitely share it with you now. Uh, so since, since I'm working with trade um, and integration issues most of all, I have tried to put a couple of examples um, 
I hope you can see now a big picture of the presentation, right? Uh, okay, great. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the one thing I would, I would actually prefer if you um, put the questions in uh, Q&A during uh, my presentation, because I think that it's uh, more helpful to get direct uh, an answer if that's clarification or you do, don't understand something. For me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of quite in the topic, so it might be the case that I'm telling you something you don't understand, so please ask before, um, yeah before we forget about it and go to the end and then you don't remember your question. Um, I will, can I, can I, I will check. Yeah, so I can open extra on another screen, the Q and A um, window so I can see also if there are questions. Um, and yeah, so that's why it's my concern. I do want to be helpful for you. That's why please ask if you don't understand something. And I did put lots of stuff in the um, slides, but uh, we should, we are not um, going to go through everything. As long as you are interested, we can go deeper. If you're not interested, we can um, drop and, and go further to other topics. So uh, here is the overview. Um, in general, I would like um, to say just a couple of words about the GE methodology because you have already a couple of seminars so um, you are kind of um, you know about what we are talking here about right and then um, I've prepared a couple of examples three papers from my own work um, the first one um, a general equilibrium evaluation of the fiscal cost of trade liberalization in Ukraine this choice actually uh, was more or less made by my supervisor in Essen uh, who actually suggested me for this webinar, um, he said that you're interested more in um, tax reforms. So that's the work that I've done uh, was uh, more fiscal policy um, focused. That's why um, it's in here. The second example, it's um, the World Bank um, project on the WTO session of Belarus. Uh, that we've done as a um, support for the government to, during the negotiation that are still not concluded. And the third one is not a project. Since we are now talking with lots of people from Indonesia, I hope that's also helpful. Um, that's our World Bank uh, uh, report on the economic and distributional impacts of different FTAs um, on the Indonesian economy. Um, actually, this one is under revision for quite a while. Um, uh, in one of the journals, I don't remember which one, but uh, due to the whole pandemic story, <laughs> unfortunately, we're not able to um, revise it yet, but it's um, definitely available as a working paper um, on the World Bank um, website. I didn't include any further um, sources in the slides because I you have here all of the citations and the links. So uh, if you want to know more, please just use the links from this first um, slide or second. <laughs> second. Okay, um, let me start with generally talking about um, CGEs. Um, so this class of models um, is especially helpful when we need a real world assessment of some policies. When we work in a second or even third best world and um, have some existing distortions like tariffs, taxes, when we have some production technologies already in place, as well as some determined trade links between different countries. And we want to have some insights about the effects of, a, of an external shock on producers, consumers, in different sectors or on different production factors, if you think about skilled and unskilled workers, capital. Um, or, of course, we're also interested in the overall impact, right, for the whole economy or even global impact if we're talking about large-scale models where you have an um, agreement with lots of countries and then you have even a distributional effect across the countries, right? And all of that happens um, with, given the, all of the interactions between different agents and uh, within different markets. So it is a powerful scientific method to um, for comprehensive ex ante simulations of adjustment effects and used by different policies um, in the global economy or single country, accounting for general equilibrium effects across countries and markets. Um, they incorporate transactions among different economic agents, firms, households, governments, capture a wide set of 
impacts derived from a shock. Well, I will show you lots of different results, but I didn't focus, for example, for sector on sectoral results because it's, it's, we don't have really much time about for it. But there are still um, lo lots of results that you can produce with a CGE model, and there are a very very broad range of shocks that you can simulate. You see here examples from taxation, migration, commodity price shock, trade policy, climate change, energy, um, demographics, and, and lots more. Um, and if you're interested about the topics, what you generally can do is that you can just, for example, go to the website, GTAP website, which is one of the biggest and, and, and uh, more comprehensive data sets. Um, and they have annual conferences where all of the researchers working with CGEs uh, present their work. So that's uh, probably the, the best reference to go on to see what's recent on CGE modeling right now. Um, important thing is that CGE models are based on micro foundations, since we use the data from micro level and the theory, actually economic theory that is also behind, and they are calibrated, not estimated. So you build your theore theoretical model um, with equations and you calibrate it given the data um, the, that you uh, put together. Um, and um, yeah, it is widely, very, very widely used in policy advice by different um, NGOs, European Commission, um, and universities. Um, and, and actually, um, there are lots of other methods, of course. It depends always from your research question if you um, use CG model or something different. There are structural gravity models, for example, now developed by Philip Ryan and co-authors that also incorporate some general equilibrium effects. There are agent-based models. Uh, there are dynamic and stochastic models that Helga will also talk about. So uh, it always depends on the research question, which methodology is best, right? Mm -hmm. But if you need lots of results and the overall impact, I think that CGE models are the most detailed um, in that sense. Um, okay, I, I just brought a um, yeah flow chart to, to show you the structure of the CGE models, but probably you have already seen it. So we have here all of the agents, the producers, government, households, um, and the markets. And uh, we know that the producers produce goods or services um, using different production factors or investment capital from the capital markets. Under factor markets, we can think about the workers, natural resources, um, different skilled workers, right? You can disaggregate that how much you want. And of course, um, intermediate inputs from product markets, and they produce for consumption of government, household, and for exports, right? Um, you, you see here also the taxes, so the producers pay the taxes um, on final goods that go into public budget, factor taxes for production factors. Um, the households, they kind of provide the production factors, right, because they are the workers, and they all also have some capital private saving that they pr provide for the um, capital markets, um, so they get income from that and spend it for goods and services. Um, income taxes also paid to the government, but there are also transfers. That's what you also find in the data. There are always um, some transfers from the household, uh, from the government to the households, as well as from the broad. And yeah, um, capital markets uh, are built from different savings, public foreign savings and, and private savings. And the government has also public budget was all taxes. Um, consume some product and services, but also provides public services for free for households, right? And that's what you have actually in each country. If you have a multi-country model, you have to describe all of that given some um, theoretic um, equations um, that provide you a general equilibrium in each factor and good market or services market that you have in your model. Um, no questions so far. <laughs> okay, sorry, that's, uh, I will, should not use the mouse better because then <laughs> you are quite, quite far away from where you are. Okay, um, so here's the next slide that I wanted to actually include because it shows how much work is behind such a CGE analysis and that's the chart from the 
Uh, I don't know if it's famous in Indonesia, in Germany, it's quite famous. It's a, it's the black box paper by Beringer, Rutherford and Wiegard because lots of people, they do not work with CGE models. They think, well, that's kind of really black box because you don't know what happens and then you have some results. But it is, behind it is a Siri and data, the real uh, world data. So it's not really black box if you, um, get acquainted with it, you will understand it, but there is lots of work that has to be done to get the study um, to the end and to provide some results. And first of all, of course, you start with the policy background with the research question that you have, and then you, you need to think of the theoretical background for the model, right? So what kind of theory you have to incorporate in the model to be able to answer your research question. And then if you have both determined the, the theoretical background, you know what kind of data you need additional to the general data that you definitely need to build a, to build a um, general equilibrium model. So then you go to the data um, and model um, stage and um, it's a, a big amount of data even for the simplest model, right? So you start with input output table, then you do need national accounts. Um, to plug in a couple of numbers, then um, you need different text data, income and, and, and expenditure data, and much, much more. You will see the list of data sources that I have included for our examples. And um, another thing, uh, what you definitely also need is that, that you need some elasticities for the functions that you choose uh, to describe your the behavior of agents, right? So. Um, those are usually estimated in the literature and, and you assume and you can do some sensitivity analysis if you are not sure if those are, for example, not estimated for a specific country or specific, I don't know, um, case that you have um, in, in, in mind. And if you have all of the data sources, then you need to uh, construct a consistent data set, the benchmark equilibrium data set that um, has to be then calibrated in the next step to your theoretical model, right? So you, that's what I already said, you don't, you, you take the data from the um, different national and, and best case data sources and calibrate the model to those data that cal cal calculate all of the parameters. And the, the, the most important step is the replication check, if that is successful. What does it mean? It means nothing, different than to try to run the model that you have constructed with the data that you have constructed without any integration so that the model does not do any computational work. It just replicates your basic data set, right? And if that is true, then you've, date, you've done a great job. You have a really consistent data set and the model does communicate with, with the data very good. If not, there are some unbalances in the data, there is some mistakes maybe in the um, code uh, for, for the model. And then the story starts, you need to debug, you need to find the, the reason for it. And as long as that doesn't work, you cannot actually do any simulations, right? Because you're not sure if, 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 if where, where the problem is. And, but if, it, if, if you're done and the model is calibrated and the replication check is successful, then you can go on and to uh, make all of your policy experiments, run the simulations, and um, report the results, analyze the results, see if they do make sense. Um, additionally, you can also make some sensitivity analysis, which is usually very, very helpful because you are never, well, I had never had a, a case where I had all of the perfect data and, and, and the estimates for the country I need and uh, well, everything, you know, so you, you do need to make um, lots of assumptions in such a, a large scale model. And if you want to check your assumptions and how sensitive your outcomes are regarding those assumptions, that's the way to do it. You're doing those sensitivity analysis. You're just running the model with some upper lower bounds for elasticities with different assumptions for simulations. For example, if you're not sure um, what is actually at the end of the negotiation, right? But what are the outcome? You can run um, additional simulation with different data, right? Assuming different base year. Um, and then if you have all of the results, you can produce really very good conclusions and policy recommendations that you can um, then share with policymakers and to show 
what is actually the best alternative um, uh, regarding this uh, research question? So um, it's a lot of work. Maybe uh, I hope that you, you can imagine it given this chart. Um, and um, yeah, before, before you go through it, you, you never imagine it. It was uh, my case with this first example study. I still remember uh, I, I came first um, to my supervisor and said, well, you know, um, I want to work with CGEs for my master's thesis. And he was like, are you sure? <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, but it, it did work out. And the first study was um, the trade liberalization case of Ukraine, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement that we have modeled. And I have really started from, the, from scratch and uh, built the complete data set by myself and then really learned a lot. So that was the, the, the most important first step in my um, career that times. And what we did here, we uh, simulated just um, elimination of tariffs, but um, we did have a look on the costs of this um, tariff elimination. That means for, for developing countries, you know that the share of tariff revenues is quite high. In, in, in case of Ukraine, it was 4.5%. And um, we evaluated different scenarios. The first one, we didn't allow uh, any endogenous adjustment, meaning that uh, there is loss and tariff revenues and, 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 and nothing else. So the, the governmental spending has to be reduced. In the second scenario, we assume that um, indirect tax rates can adjust endogenously so that there is a compensation for the lost tariff revenue and the government budget can be a hold um, constant or fixed. And in the third one, we had a um, assumption that the EU provides some um, financial support for the Ukrainian government to implement the agreement and that as part can be also used to compensate for uh, the loss of tariff revenues. And um, here is the slide was the um, general model characteristics and uh, the part that I told you that we don't have to go through, I did include this um, figures with um, model description or nesting structure. Um, but if you are interested in that, we can definitely go through it and I can explain you what I mean. If you're not interested, just forget about it. Um, and I guess I have two of them in this uh, presentation. So it's just um, an illustration how it can be seen and what is included in each stage in production here, in, even in domestic demand, and so on and so forth. Okay, so regarding the model, that's the simplest model that I have in this presentation and the simplest models I, I have worked in my life. Um, it's a static small economy model with um, 38 sectors. And here we have different uh, production factors, capital, unskilled skilled labor, and we have included sector specific capital in mining pipeline transportation because those two sectors are um, state owned um, in Ukraine and that was important to keep the capital only in this sector so it cannot relocate to other sectors when we have a shock right um, we have here perfect competition and constant transfer scale so uh, all of the goods uh, are produced um, in the sector with the same technology we have army and trade structure what does that mean is that we say the simplest structure um, we distinguish the varieties of goods or services by the region of origin, right? So uh, because regions have different, let's say, production technologies, the goods or services are different, and um, we import them because they are uh, differentiated. And then the um, consumers can decide, do they want to have uh, imported or um, export uh, imported or domestic goods, and then if they want to have important goods from which region, because here we have also disaggregated the external sector into nine, nine regions, so uh, they have a choice from different regions. And another interesting feature, what we did here, usually you have a representative, one representative household per country. In this case, we did disaggregate it into urban, rural, poor, and non-poor. Um, because a colleague of mine that we worked on that um, was also interested in micro simulations um, that she has done in another uh, paper on that. Okay, uh, I see no um, questions in that, uh, but I do see that the reason it chat something. Okay, <laughs> you see that I, I did, I had just the wrong 
uh, window open. Um, Uh, actually, what's in the chat oh. is uh, it said that if the participant ask question in Indonesian language, then I will help them translate it into English. But so okay. far, there has been no okay. question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not that's why I was yet. like trying to read and I was like, oh, oh okay, something's wrong here. <laughs> no, okay. thanks, thanks a lot for clarification. Okay, so okay. I will try to keep it also open in case I see there are some questions, but yeah. Uh, you can also interrupt me if you see that there is some question and I don't um, uh, don't see it. So please go ahead and interrupt me. That that's all fine. Okay. Um, if there are no questions to the general description of model, um, here you can see the list of data sources, which is quite small. Let's say for this model because it's one country model, a small, but still. There are quite a uh, number of different publications from the State Statistics Committee of Ukraine that we used um, for the study and the household budget survey to disaggregate the household. Um, and um, also UN Comp trade data to have the trade shares for the um, external um, sector to disaggregate the imports um, to these nine regions. Okay, then um, here are the results. And actually the, the first example, um, with the aggregate result that you see here, um, I use just one table to show you what, what you can uh, actually provide as a um, macro, uh, let's say output or aggregate output of the model. And first of all, what we are interested here in is definite tariff revenue, right? So we see from the benchmark, which is, which is uh, the, the zero scenario, right? You have the reduction of tariff revenues and then, um, the, the goes um, the assumption. In the first one, we say that there is no um, compensation. So we have here reduction in public services by almost 2% and indirect tax rate remains constant like in the benchmark. And then um, you can report also, in this case, we have reported the price index for um, different types of um, households that the index, because it includes all of the uh, goods and services that the households consume, real GDP, factor return, and the main indicator for um, overall impact actually is the welfare index, the Hicks welfare index. Um, why it's the main indicator, maybe it's important to say, uh, that's actually the variable that reflects how the consumption of household um, reacts on the policy shock. And this is not um, affected by the post-solve calculation. So for example, if you need to calculate GDP or other things, you need to calculate them after you have done the simulation and to calculate the whole uh, value of production. So one is forced and you have to take uh, make assumption about which price uh, indices you use, right? For this consumption welfare index uh, based on consumption of households, you don't do that. And that's um, the, the, the most robust indicator, let's say. Uh, actually, um, there is uh, one question here, uh, and yeah, I will sure. try to translate it. So this is a question from uh, Mr. Sigit Setiawan. He asked, uh, the household survey that you use is from 2007, but what about the other variables and the policy in your model? Uh, what <sighs> year uh, are the other variables uh, and the policy? Uh, thank you. So that's, first of all, that's very, very old paper. Uh, that's why the data is quite old. Um, we have there the base year for the whole model is for 2007. So as you see the input output tables and national accounts for 2007, but it's typically, well, typically it's the case that economists do not publish um, input output tables, especially every year um, using new data. It's uh, well, at least it was the case for Ukraine. So um, that was the only choice that we had. We were working on it in two, we started on it 2009, I guess, 2009, 10. And um, yeah, this was the best available at that um, time. And sometimes, um, there are also data inconsistencies because sometimes, for, I don't remember for which one of those publications, some, some of them were a bit um, older, someone a bit um, more um, up to date. 
but that's the thing that you have to cope with. You have to kind of co provide this consistent data set. So that's very important questions. And that's why I said this data work for this first paper, it took me more than half a year to get everything really consistent in a, a data set so I could run the first um, replication check. Yeah, I hope it answers the question. Um, yeah, I'm coming back to results. Um, uh, what is important then here is that we see that in case of the tariff elimination, we have a positive welfare impact on the households, but we have to be cautious because this welfare impact, it doesn't include any public services provided by the government, right? Because those are provided for free. To, here we have just the consumption of goods and services, right? And that, that one have to be cautious. Um, that's why usually what we do in general equilibrium models always, we keep this government spending this uh, and, and provision of this public services constant, right? So to be sure that there is no influence of that. Um, that's why one should be careful in interpreting those welfare results when you have such a model set up and when you don't fix governmental spending. In the second scenario, you see that we have an increase of indirect tax rate. Um, and that's why we also here see the increase in price indices for the household. So due to increase in indirect taxes, the prices for goods and services consumed go up and you have even slightly negative impacts, especially on um, urban and rural households um, and even on um, rural poor also slightly negative. So that's kind of the, the narrows assess, okay, the, the government should be prudent in funding the liberalization costs by means of an increase in tax rates, then that can really lead to negative welfare effect. And the third scenario shows, okay, we have the reduced tariff revenue, but we have no reduction in public services. So since those are financed by additional aid and we have no increase in indirect tax rates. So we have even a reduction in price indices through cheaper intermediate, uh, cheaper imports due to um, eliminated tariffs. And we have definitely slightly positive welfare effects for um, the households. The foreign aid is quite, quite low. Actually, it's 2.7, but in Ukrainian currency, because data is all in Ukrainian currency, right? So here, the, the message to the government is, um, in general, we have only slightly positive um, welfare results for Ukraine, because the tariffs are already quite low, because of Ukraine's WTO recession, and the case of foreign aid compensating for the um, tar tariff uh, revenue losses was aid will help to um, get the highest benefit for the country. Okay, so that's kind of an example that you see where you can just a bit play with, with the taxes and, and see what, what will happen. Um, and there is also, you can also try to set up simulation where you try to find the optimal tariff, for example, or tax and, and see what, what will happen with the economy. Now, the second example, if there are no questions, um, the second example is the project for Belarus, and um, it is, again, a static small econ economy uh, model that we have developed for Belarus using much larger number of sources, as you see. Um, and um, again, here we, we went from scratch and used the national data because it was very important to deliver proper um, very detailed results. We have 35 sectors for ex exogenous regions, just like in the previous model, but um, the modeling uh, is, is much more um, complicated and much more interesting. First of all, we have the same um, structure in some goods and services sectors with Armington, saying that the goods are differentiated by the um, region of origin, right? Um, but we also have imperfectly competitive goods uh, sectors following Krugman, which allows us to um, differentiate goods on the firm level. So each firm produces its own variety and it's different from the others. And here, therefore, we can have this love of variety setting where consumers do increase their variety, uh, welfare from just the availability of more varieties. So think just about you have 
you, you, you are in the supermarket and you are standing in front of um, all of different wines, for example, right? So you have different wine from Italy, from France, from um, Chile, from wherever else, but you also have different um, wines from within the one country, right? Not only um, like wine, white wine from, from Germany, right? So that's um, the way how you should think about it. We have here this big variety and it um, does matter a lot, including this variety effects. And step forward, you can go um, using Mallet's models and that would mean that you um, have all, also the endogenous productivity effects. So you have the uh, relocation from the less productive firm that exits the market to more productive um, that can actually export to some external markets to uh, the goods, right? So that's the, those productivity effects are, but only in Mallet's model that we haven't incorporated here, but in all other papers that we've done. And another very important thing is that we include here FDI in business services. So the general idea is um, that you have the foreign affiliate sales and you can calculate which share of output is produced by domestic firms and which share is produced by multinationals. And then you can distinguish um, in, in the production structure of those firms because the FDI firms, they do use the production factors from the uh, host country, right? But still, they have some inputs from headquarter countries. Just think like about the technological transfer or, or manager that um, kind of introduced their know-how um, in the uh, host country. And that's how we model it. And one important also thing that um, I can be able to illustrate here. So don't be afraid of this figure. We don't, we're not going to go through it, but just to illustrate you one important thing, which, which I think uh, makes a big difference. Um, we have here in this model, the substitution between production factors on one side and business services on the one other side. So usually you have business services also as, um, as intermediate good, but here you say, well, instead of hiring, for example, a lawyer or an accountant in my own firm, I can just use some business services from accounting or, or, or legal firm, firm, right? So that's the thing that we do here and going deeper since we include FDI in services, you can use services from um, domestic firms that might be real domestic firms or the multinational that are present on domestic market, or you can also use the imported services. So that is a very important um, assumption since that increases your productivity in the host country because you have access to much more varieties of business services and the productivity or, or pr production technology of multinational uh, firms or services suppliers is different and better from usually from the ones um, that are present on domestic market. So that is um, an example of what you can do in such a, um, in such a setting. Um, and I saw here a question, so let me interrupt that. Which criteria can we use uh, static small open economy CGE model? For Indonesia, what is the simplest CGE model appropriate? Is it still static small economy or else for Indonesia? Well, you know, that's, that's a very good question. It depends on, on your research question, right? So I will have also an example. Next one is with a dynamic model, the recursive dynamic web, which solves every year. So it's not a forecasting dynamic model. Um, you need much more data for it, but I, I, I will talk about it. And, um, it depends on what is the exact research question, because if you just want to have the um, effect from going from one general equilibrium that you have in your benchmark to the, let's say, medium term equilibrium, um, you can um, use also the static model. You don't need the, the dynamic. But if you do want to have all of the dynamics year by year and, and having um, those results, well, how we expect it will be developed, then you definitely need an dynamic model. Okay. Um, about the policy experiments. By the way, I just opened the final paper. Um, don't uh, be surprised. I guess 
these slides are based on my uh, old slide that we used uh, for uh, dissemination of the results after the project, but in the um, before we published it, we got some comments and we have included some more scenarios and I guess reduction of one more additional um, of cross cross border barriers here. So the numbers are slightly different in the final world economy paper from those that you see in the table. I have just noticed it today and then decided not to change any slides. So you have the final, but just to you to know. But anyways, here we had a, a quite large number of simulations. First of all, the WTO session scenario. And <clears throat> given that we have this um, FDI and services and different firms, we have different types of barriers against FDI firms. First of all, those are discriminatory barriers. So that um, are against only foreign suppliers of services. And there are non-discriminatory barriers that apply against both domestic and foreign uh, service suppliers. And we reduce them by 50 and 25%, the non-discriminatory less because logically you, you um, cannot uh, change your regulations at home so drastically. Um, and then we have the changes in export prices for sectors that uh, were subject to anti-dumping. That's to the price effect that I have also mentioned as an example. And we reduce uh, some NTEs, NTBs in agriculture that are um, inconsistent with um, the um, WTO um, um, procedures. Then what we had additionally, it, by the way, that is um, also additional um, assumption or um, the run that goes in, in, in direction of dynamic models. So we have um, run a simulation with um, steady state assumption, which means that, well, um, you usually we have the endowment of production factors, labor, capital, constant in, in the model, right? And the um, factor remuneration, wages, capital returns, they adjust, right? In this case, when you have a steady state formulation, you um, keep the capital returns fixed and let the capital endowment of the country adjust. So uh, here you can kind of have an approximation of dynamic model where you have always assumptions about the capital accumulation over time, right? So that is another way to work with static model if you have want to have some, um, let's say, um, capital accumulation, other capital um, accumulation features. Um, we had also the, the most important one, also interesting simulations, um, reduction of non-discriminatory services barriers by 50%. Just an illustration and privatization was also very interested. We had an extra data set for um, um, the countries. Uh, the, the Belarus, it was different firms, um, state owned, private and mixed and with their productivity. So we were able to simulate the shift in productivity given that the number of state owned firm rate is reduced by 50% and the private sector increase. And that was also very, very interesting. And here you see the main results. <clears throat> so um, the most important is um, the overall effect is around 8.2%. In, in, I guess in the final paper, it's higher because we took into account another um, barrier against um, imported services. Um, and it's interesting because you see here, you have here the um, kind of part of the sensitivity analysis. So we did run the simulations with uh, re reduction of barriers um, by type, only discriminatory uh, FDI barriers, non-discriminatory, then export prices, and then NTVs in agriculture. And if you look at the effects, you see that the main effects are coming from the reduction of FDI barriers, discriminatory and especially non-discriminatory barriers, right? So um, that's again gives the information for policymakers that's the way we should try to find, um, uh, to negotiate deeper and to, to, to allow for more liberalization. Um, you see here again, a lot, long list of results. Um, interesting also the capital stock change for the steady state. In the steady state simulation, you see a double almost, right? Um, effect on the welfare and the increase in capital stock is only 6.6%. So it's not that huge. Okay, and just to have give you an idea, for example, the, this alternative scenarios with non-discriminatory barriers bring much higher um, gains, 11 over 11% 11 for non-discriminatory barriers. And in case of privatization, it's 
even over 36. Okay, uh, there I is, saw a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's in Indonesian language. Uh, I'll oh, help okay. you. Uh, so Alif Satyanto wants to know uh, what's, uh, what year is the newest I.O. table in East Europe? What year oh. is the newest? I guess, let me think about it. We have just finished last year another project for Ukraine. I guess it's 2015 or something. So okay. it's not really that recent. <laughs> okay, so uh, the answer is 2015, right? I, I guess, yeah. As yeah. long as I remember, it was the latest one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so that's the second example with much more um, inputs and modeling stuff and, and examples of simulations. And now we, we, we will try to go to the uh, quickly to the third example for Indonesia, which is hopefully also interesting for you. And that is, as I said, a dynamic model. And the whole study is actually a top-down approach where we have a CGE, dynamic CGE model on the top and um, a micro simulation model, it's called global income distribution dynamics model um, on the bottom to run the micro simulations. Um, so first about the CGE model. Uh, this is called linkage. You will find uh, in the paper also uh, all of the um, citations if you want to have a look at the model description and in generally the model the code includes lots of different um, options how you want what, what, what you want would like to cho cho choose for different um, let's say theoretical model right um, in this case it's quite a simple model because we have a um, large scale model with 35 countries because we um, focus on different uh, free trade agreements, right? And that's why we had to have a very broad country coverage and we have still lots of production sectors, 17 production sectors. So, um, and it's a recursive dynamic model that runs from 2011 till 2030. So you can imagine that running just one scenario that takes really long in, in such a large scale. That's why, um, it's more simpler regarding the um, trade structure, for example. Here we have just the armament structure where we distinguish the goods between different regions of origin, so no firm heterogeneity. Um, and then you have all of the additional assumptions that you need for the um, dynamic models, right? Aggregate investment is savings that, which is typical. Government expenditures are fixed. Fiscal balance is fixed. That's also what I said. That's usually you, you do, and the net capital flows also. Then you need to make assumptions about your uh, growth of your um, labor, right? Because uh, it's definitely not fixed uh, year by year. So we use the um, projections based on EASA um, data and, and, and UN 2015 population growth projections. And those actually are also used for the baseline development of the microeconometric model um, for the micro simulations, right? Th those are consistent for, for the two parts on, on the top and on the bottom. Then uh, capital accumulation is endogenously de determined by investment and depreciation rates. Um, the productivity shock, so the productivity of your labor, you have to also assume something. It is calculated first to the past data and fixed the development uh, or increase is fixed after 2019 at the level that is consistent with historical values for all of the countries. Um, that's definitely a GTAP based model. Um, because we have so many countries, there is no chance that you uh, try to build any, any data set by, by yourself. Um, and um, since, uh, yeah, we are working with lots of governments, usually they all want to try to find the current developments um, in, in the data, in the baseline. That's why we always also track the historical GDP, the current account, and then use the forecast, the World Bank forecast from JEP, in this case, from January 2016 until 2019. Okay. Um, regarding the micro simulation model, I will not say a lot because I'm not an expert in that, but um, Helga can maybe uh, help. There are a lot of also description and, and references in the paper regarding this, but to give you the broad picture, 
what is going on here? You have also the baseline because it's dynamic uh, methodology. You have also the baseline in the micro simulation model. So you take all of those assumptions regarding um, labor growth or population growth um, and so on and so forth. And then after you have the, sh the, the, the effects from the CGE model, especially on um, labor endowment, skilled, unskilled labor, or um, labor that works in uh, agriculture, non-agriculture especially, there is also a difference. And um, de de development of prices, also food and non-food prices that play a very big role. All of these results, they are transmitted from the CGE model into the micro simulation model. And then uh, it uses it to distribute those results uh, for different um, households types, different taking account the income distribution within the country and so on and so forth. And you can produce also very nice effects. So just to give you an idea about um, the simulations, uh, we have here a really long list of different FTAs in the baseline. We also take into account all of the free trade agreements uh, that have been implemented after the start in 2011. So we're due the trade barriers in accordance to that. So we have just really isolated effect of each free trade agreement um, in our results. And we model here RCEP, FDAP, the EU Indonesia, um, actually, it's not FDA set, it's, it's, it's a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, sorry for that one. And at that time, when we started to work on that, it was still TPP, not CPTPP. <laughs> That's why I just used the, the old slides um, and our old um, um, text for it. And we had, but definitely here, TPP 11 and TPP 15. And in case of 15, we assume that Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and Korea uh, joined the um, CPTPP agreement in 2019, which has which is also <laughs> already in the past. Okay, um, and here are the main results. Um, what is actually interesting is to see how uh, which deal out of all of those uh, is the most um, beneficial for Indonesia, and it's definitely the EU Indonesia uh, agreement according to our results. Then. Um, the, one of the biggest um, is definitely the FTAP because it covers a very, a very high number of countries. And then you can see the TPP 15 when if, if Indonesia joins the CPTPP agreement, it uh, has also quite good impact. Uh, oh, sorry. And the RCEP, actually the lowest. I don't take into account actually TPP 11 that much because um, Indonesia is not part of it. So you don't see actually very, it's, it's a big a bit of GB, GDP. Uh, improvement, but uh, income and exports and, and trade do decrease because you have diversion of trade from Indonesia to other um, countries of, of the agreement, right? Okay, and, and maybe a very short um, uh, remark regarding the second part of results. We, what we did here, we wanted to have an upper bound of the results, having not only this assumption that we uh, fix uh, public uh, productivity increase on the historic level over the time, but we know that trade liberalization leads to additional productivity increase, right? And we, the right econometric study that say that, uh, I don't know, 10%, I guess, decrease in tariffs leads to 0.5 increase of, um, productivity, and that's what we actually did. We calculated the average uh, reduction of uh, tariff, uh, weighted average reduction of tariffs, and then calculated the productivity kick, let's say, and simulated the upper bound. And you see, due to the fact that between EU and Indonesia, we had the highest average uh, reduction in, 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 in um, tariffs, we have the highest effect and it's it's really huge. But it might be overestimated because we use the tariffs for the whole productivity of labor and might not be that high, for example, in services sectors, right? So, but it's an illustration, you know, how you can try uh, to do that having um, limited uh, opportunities. And here are the results from the micro simulations, um, some of them. And here you see the poverty reduction effects. So for example, um, for Indonesia, we use definitely higher uh, poverty lines because uh, Indonesia is no low income economy where we use usually $1.9 um, uh, per day. Here it's 3.2 and 5.5. And you can see that there is increase. Um, so 
2.5 or even 3.3 millions of uh, people will be uh, above, additionally above the poverty line in case of EU Indonesia SEPA. Then uh, you have the FTAP, that the second one with the highest results, and TPP 15 would bring the lowest um, um, reduction of poverty. Uh, and in case of RCEP and, and TPP, it's even more. Um, lower, but in case of TPP11, you can see here, if you use the 5.5 uh, poverty line, there is actually even um, a possibility of more people getting onto the, under this poverty line, right? 0 0.3 millions, um, because yeah, those di di diver diversion effects actually. And uh, so that's more or less good news. We have for almost all scenarios that we expected increase uh, in population above the poverty lines. But uh, if you look at distribution of this income increase um, for different percentiles of um, income distribution, it, it, it's not that good. So we have more inequality in all of the three scenarios in EU, Indonesia, FTAP, and, and TPP 15, because in the lower percentiles, the increase um, in income is not that big comparative to the higher percentiles, right? So the richer um, households would definitely um, gain more. It's not the case in case of RCEP, you see, because here we have high increase in the lower percentiles than um, in the um, higher percentiles. So it's uh, a better distributional outcome in case of RCEP. There are more additional results in the paper, what, what drives um, this um, distribution and what are the, the main uh, reasons behind it. But yeah, we don't have any time. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> oh, already 15 minutes. Um, okay, I see. Two another questions. Um, how do you get Armington values for your CGE models on Indonesian cases? Uh, what do you mean with Armington values? You mean the elasticities, or because usually the GTAP data set provides also and GTAP model provides elasticities. We use also some standard values that we've got from the literature. Um, if you mean the rest, the rest is calibrated from um, the data, the benchmark data. Uh, so how, how much trade is coming from Indonesia to all other countries that are incorporated. And in every sector, the goods are treated as a, um, substitutes, right? Completely the same um, produced under the same production structure. So that's coming all from the data. Um, if, if you have, if you would, if it's not the, the, the answer you want to have, then you have to explain me what you mean under Armington values. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So no questions. I hope it was not too, uh, too much and too complicated. <laughs> Thanks a lot, then I stop sharing. Okay. Okay, then uh, the next one, uh, Helge, uh, if you uh, want to share screen, uh, please, you can do it now. Yeah, thank you very much, Soriana. That was great. And I would, we will definitely, our team uh, will definitely want to talk to you about uh, the data, especially used for Indonesia. Let me share my screen. And thank you, uh, Amanda, for your introduction. Let me find my, here. Um, for the kind introduction, thank you very much for in, inviting me to, uh, to give a talk here. Um, as with um, Zoyana, I would ask if you have questions to please raise them intermittently during my talk. Um, I wasn't sure what the background is um, of participants. So um, uh, if you want me to go into detail on some uh, methodologies I, I, I mentioned, then I'll be glad to do that. Um, so please ask questions uh, during, during my presentation. So as Amanda said uh, in, in the introduction, I'm, I'm not really an expert in CGE modeling. I'm a macroeconomist trained in uh, what's called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, but specifically there are also models of the labor market. 
And um, so, you, so you may ask, why, why are you here? <laughs> okay, so first, we're working with the institute where I'm located in Germany, working with the GIZ, uh, with a, a team in Indonesia, um, trying to build a CGE model uh, that can be used for the analysis of tax policy and government revenue. And my, I'm, well, I'm new to the CGE uh, field itself. And as Zoyana also mentioned in her introduction, I've had to learn that it's a lot of work in trying to get the data right, trying to get consistency between the model and the data. And we're still at that stage. Um, I'm actually not going to talk a lot about this work, although right now it seems to be uh, working as my co-author uh, told me yesterday, at least we're getting a very simple version of the model to run. So that's very good news. But what, what I want to talk about today is, um, is really about CGE modeling from, from the perspective of an outsider. Okay, so, um, and I think this is very useful because I hope this is useful. The literatures in macro and CGE as a part of macro are, well, they're you know separate strands and teams of people working on different things. And actually kind of, I think what people are looking at, uh, the kind of policy questions they're interested in, these things are converging. And um, in, in such a case, it's really important to build bridges uh, between these different literatures. And I think CGE, um, is exactly the, the platform to do this. And that's also why I am interested uh, uh, in, in, in working in this area and currently working, learning a lot uh, in this area. So I'm bringing your perspective. This is, I changed my title a little bit, integrating micro perspectives and macro perspectives into CGE modeling. Okay, and I'm actually, uh, I'm a policy interested economist and in that, it's also why I came to CGE now. Um, so I want to talk about some stuff there that Zoriana also mentioned, and I hope it's it's just, I think it's so extremely important that, that I want to repeat some of these things. So most economists, hopefully, um, are interested in the analysis of economic policy. And right? so forget about particular contexts, or these might be labor market policies, these might be trade policies. Um, there's two ways to go about this kind of policy analysis. One is ex post evaluation, right? And this is at least in Germany and the US and Anglo Saxon context, is what I would say 90% of economists nowadays do is ex post policy evaluation, especially in, in, um, in developed uh, economies where you can say there's kind of a, a need to do fine tuning of stuff. Okay, so they um, a particular policy has been implemented. And now the question is, how, wh what are the effects of that policy? That's a question of econometric identification or a variant of that here uh, behind this, a little different are ran random controlled trial settings, okay? Where you really try to um, build an experimental setting where you have a clearly defined control group, a treatment group, and you give the policy, the treatment to one group and compare it to what happens to the control group. Econometric identification doesn't have a controlled experimental setting, but it tries to replicate that using identification strategies. What's, if you're familiar with this, um, for example, um, instrumental variables, um, all kinds of techniques to, to glean causality from historical data in terms of what did the policy cause? Okay, that's very important stuff, right, to do. Obviously, the big drawback twofold is what, one thing is, um, even if you're not a macroeconomist, um, you can only evaluate policies that have been done in the past. Yeah, so it doesn't really answer questions about conceivable policies you might want to implement for the future. Yeah, that's exactly what the second point uh, here is and what CGE does and what I call generally quantitative theory. If you're interested in policy design, you, you, you're doing something before the fact, okay? Next, let me jump back to the pol ex post policy evaluation. Even if you're doing RCT, which is not really only ex post, yeah? Because you're 
thinking about a policy, and then you're implementing it in an experimental setting. Even, um, at least if you're a macroeconomist, this is not really something you can do, okay? Um, because you can't do experiments with whole sets or sets of economists if you want uh, your whole population of countries to do experiments. In. Or if you're interested in global linkages, there's no way for you to do this, okay? So even though RCT, random controlled trials, is a gold standard, uh, we all know it from, from discussions in, in medical, in the medical literature right now. Econometric identification so is really clean way, the RCT people won't say this, but uh, is a clean way of trying to get at causality if you have the right data, okay? But often important questions you can't even address even using econometric identification exposed because you don't have the right data to establish the kind of quasi-experimental settings we can glean at causality. And next, if you want to design policy, no chance, because if it's not been there in the past, you can never use econometric identification on historical data. So if you're interested in policy design, you have to do something else. What, what do we do? Basically, from the start of studying economics, we learn theories, right? We learn models. And, and this is exactly what CGE does, and this is almost what almost all of modern macroeconomics does, is develop models. And in CGE actually earlier, but starting in the 70s, 80s, 90s, other strands of the modern macro literature have also gotten quantitative in what they do, trying to, realizing that interactions, especially at the macro level are so complex that any qualitative analysis, there's so many countervailing effects, um, especially in general equilibrium that you really need to have a quantification of these models. Even if you're interested not in something like welfare, which is inherently quantitative, uh, but if you're, even if you're interested in just which ways do prices and quantities move. So there's a, there's a need for, for theory and there's a need for quantitative theory. In particular, policy design can be, you can think about this in two different ways. One is much more ambitious than the other. The first is you want to analyze concrete pro policy proposals. Somebody tells you what they want to do. They have heard that uh, changing the tax system in some way might be beneficial in terms of efficiency, might generate more revenue. They have a particular proposal, maybe some constraints, you need to generate a certain amount of government revenue, and now you want to know what happens if I implement this particular proposal, okay? That's what most of uh, the CGE literature is doing and a lot of the other macro literature, which I'll, I'll get to in a second, just a little bit. But you can, you can think one step further. And some of the especially modern macroeconomic taxation literature is, is trying to do this in a quantitative way. You can start to think about the design of optimal policy. So let me just give you one very quick example. We did some work uh, a few years ago about the introduction of the minimum wage in, uh, minimum wage law in Germany. And um, our model was very close to a CGE model in the sense that uh, we, we just said, okay, there has been an introduction of a minimum wage uh, of a certain amount in 2015. And we wanna project, use our model to project what this introduced policy might do in the future, okay? Um, and, uh, but but the, the next question um, that, that we would wanna pursue is, um, let's say we find out that this minimum wage introduction is not bad, it's good, it's welfare enhancing for some reason, you know, imperfect competition in the labor markets could be one. Then you would immediately wanna ask, okay, if introducing a minimum wage of a certain amount is good, why not increase it further? Which is, the, which is the best minimum wage? And obviously you can think about such design of optimal policy problems under certain restrictions, right? Um, so Jana mentioned this, if, you, if you're in an environment where a lot of things or maybe policies even instituted from abroad in terms of trade 
you're in a world of second, third best, but still even within that world where you have a lot of frictions and wedges which drive you away from efficiency, you can still think given those frictions, what is the best I can do now, right? And so I think for us now in the world of CGE thinking, it's important to keep this thing here in mind. Yeah, obviously this is a lot of demand on, on the types of models being used. Um, in both of these, just I wanna mention again, the criteria for evaluation, either be it ex post or design ex ante, are twofold. <clears throat> well, one we might be interested in, and most policymakers would be more immediately interested in, are the effects on quantities and prices and, and their distribution, just like we've just seen, right? Um, so we call this positive in the sense of positive economics, describing what happens. And the other, the other one is normative. And we, Zoyana also had uh, some of these measures is we wanna think about what happens in terms of welfare, compensating um, variations um, and, and their distribution. So, so that's also important to keep in mind because basically you, you don't need, only need models if you're interested in welfare. Um, if you want to do a ex ante policy design you also need models um, if you're interested in welfare, okay? Because welfare is not something you see in historical data, right? So both of these things really counterfactual analysis of policy that has not been implemented and being interested in welfare, you need models. This is what I just repeat here. We need a quantitative model to construct counterfactual scenarios, what happens if you implement that policy? We don't see that in the data. And you need it also to evaluate welfare effects. I should add here, sometimes, and so Jana also mentioned this, uh, I think, uh, as I remember, sometimes you even need the model to construct a baseline for what would happen under the current policy without a regime change, right? If you're thinking about the future, you basically also need to construct your baseline. So there's a lot of model going into everything we're interested in. Now, of course, the question is, a model is when is a model good? And this is sort of the art of being a macroeconomist. Okay, nothing I will say in these bullet points following here is really something I have really sound criteria to understand if I'm satisfying these requirements. And that's, um, that's the difficulty in doing macroeconomics. So a model is good, I can just say it, if it contains the relevant economic mechanisms for the questions at hand. Yeah, so if I think some policy change, a tax rate, for example, has an effect on some decision, I should have that mechanism in there, model that decision, that mechanism. And then there's a, the second bullet point, a really strong requirement from our economist perspective about how that mechanism should be modeled. And this has to do with what macro people, perhaps many of you have heard this in, in your courses you've taken, what's called the Lucas critique. And this really justifies the need for micro foundations, right? We need to have a consistent way of modeling people's rea agents reactions to policy changes, not assume they're fixed if, if they're not fixed. Right? And there's some classic example of this. If you start taxing the number of windows on houses, which face the street and think the number of windows facing the street are gonna be constant, you're making a mistake because people, you can see this in many places, including this, where I lived in the Southern US for a while, um, they will start bricking up the windows facing the street and building the windows on the side, yeah? So people react to policy and we need to model their behavior, including their goals, their preferences, utility functions, their budget sets, endowments, to model that behavior, okay? Next bullet point, I want the model, this is called Occam's razor, to be as simple as possible in order um, to understand what's going on, right? And I think also, especially importantly in when you're doing policy advice, you want to be able to communicate what you find out in the model, be able to communicate that to policymakers. So you need good ways of summarizing the, what's going on intuitively. Sometimes methods called back of the envelope calculations are used to display the results to your audience. 
obviously right now here already there may be a, a, a huge trade-off and we see this in CGE modeling, right? A trade-off between simplicity, simplicity and containing the relevant mechanisms. I think more about single economy CGE models. So Ayana thinks about global ones, uh, often large scale ones. Uh, you, you're never gonna keep that simple, okay? The, sometimes you just can't make it simple um, without um, sacrificing the points above. Um, but all I say here is make it as simple as possible. So if there is complexity, you need to have a reason for the complexity. And often we do, but th that's the point here. And the next really tough part, remember it's quantitative theory, it needs to be parametrized appropriately so the, that the effects that you get from this counterfactual analysis are quantitatively right. As Zoyana also already said is, this me, all this means is we can only think about the kind of policy question we're asking and model the model we use to answer that question together. Now, add to that, we also have to keep in mind what is the data available? What data do we have? Otherwise, we're just you know, stoking in the dark in terms of a parameterization. In my view, coming from the outside to CGE, the, the thing is, the CGE models are inherently so complicated in the coding and the data, con uh, data consistency requirements, you all learn about SAMs, are, are really tough, okay? That one danger can be in this literature to get stuck in a particular modeling environment of CGE that has particular mechanisms, okay? And use this model, then for questions, it's not really addressed to answer or not simple enough, doesn't have the right mechanisms, maybe too complicated, okay? Like I, this is just a hunch of mine, and this is why I'm sort of in this Indonesia project we're doing, I'm thinking about bottom up in terms of model development, okay? Another point to make here is, so not every model is a macro model, right? So we um, like what one part of the simplicity in thinking about what is the relevant research question, what are the relevant mechanisms is, is you have to ask yourself when you model something, does it have to be a general equilibrium model or a partial equilibrium model? Or um, I mean, that doesn't seem like much of a choice, but it, it might boil down to which things are exogenous to my model. Is it a, is a small open economy taking the rest of the world as given, or is it, uh, do you have interaction in the prices between different regions, right? So, but those are, that's also a really important issue right there. So, I mean, to talk a little bit about this, this model structure, and again, I'm, I have the perspective of someone developing models, okay? So what are the dimensions of models to think about? One thing I mentioned already is, general versus partial equilibrium. Think about the policy question. Does it have to be, a, is it a general equilibrium issue? Is it a partial equilibrium issue? Does it have to be dynamic or static? If it doesn't have to be dynamic, make it static. But if, if for example, our aim is to analyze what a change in pension systems do in the economy, then it probably will have to be dynamic and incorporate a bunch of stuff like demographic change. That's a big issue in, in many developing countries because of population aging. Yeah, so are you interested um, dynamic versus static? Sometimes I think miss, not the, these terms are not used uh, consistently in, in the literature. You can also uh, think about long run versus short run, right? But this is not the same as dynamic versus static. So, uh, so Jana had a good example of um, where she was talking about comparing steady states, right? Um, or uh, you could think of that as a long run implication of your model when you compare steady states after all adjustment has taken place. But uh, dynamic, at least to me, means more what happens in the interim, in the transition, right? So um, you can also think about, if you think about uh, prices adjusting or factors moving between different sectors, you can think about long run versus short run effects, um, but you can, you can model this in a static comparative, what we call comparative static way, in the sense of 
once you assume that they're fixed, once you assume according to some rule that they adjust these factors of production, uh, one would be the long run impact, one would be the short run impact. The next and related point is most CGE models, are, at least to my knowledge, at least at the aggregate level, are deterministic in the sense of um, the, the, the path, if they're done dynamic, the paths that stuff follows, be they exogenous shocks, for example, they are known, right? A lot of the uh, rest of the macro literature is stochastic. Yeah, so there is productivity shocks in the future, for example, in the real business cycle literature. And, and then uh, once you start thinking now about micro foundations, people have to have expectations about what these uh, stochastic elements will do in the future and they will react to them. Yeah, uncertainty plays a role and the reaction to uncertainty. The next part of model development is the level of disaggregation. This is where CGE is, has uh, gone very far, uh, made a lot of progress. And then other issues is op open, a open or closed economy. Does it include money or can it talk about inflation and nominal prices? Does it include a financial side? financial intermediation, or is it a purely real model? And then you need to specify, this is uh, responding to Lucas' critique, behavioral foundations, including expectations, including uh, choice sets, technology, and in some, uh, a lot of modern macro information sets. So if you think about asymmetric information, who knows what, when, yeah? And you need to specify coordination equilibrium concepts, perfect, uh, sometimes, uh, perfect competition is the benchmark in all markets, but sometimes some markets will be imperfectly competitive. Other markets may not even exist called incomplete markets literature, right? So you need to specify that. And then next you need to specify the welfare concept. And uh, for example, if you think about distribution, um, do you have some kind of superstructure, like a social welfare function with which you want to evaluate changes in the distribution of welfare among agents. Again, also coming back to points Oyana, I'm citing you lots Oyana made is, um, um, how, how do we quantify? We follow a technique in this, what I call quantitative theory called calibration. Now, if you're doing classical econometrics, what you usually do is something called structural estimation. I mean, if I know what the, technically called data generating process of the real world data I have is, if I know what the true model is, I estimate its parameters and make inference and hypothesis testing on them, right? This is what the classical econometrician in me wants to do. So what the heck is calibration? <clears throat> if things are really complicated, yeah, such as they are in a macro setting, there is no way, at least at this point, maybe in 50 years, maybe a hundred years, that the models we build are even close to, uh, to representing the real world. In other words, if I would use, I have a CGE model with all the parameters, all these elasticities and share parameters not calibrated from the SAM, but they're free parameters. And now I use time series data to estimate them. Okay, the problem with that is, and it's not inherent in CGE only, but in almost all macro is, I would be using a severely misspecified model to try to make inference on parameters. Pardon my English, but the term for this is shit in, shit out. Okay, uh, if your model is wrong, which at this point, unfortunately, all, they're all incomplete, and you use them to try to estimate infer on parameter values, you're gonna get bad inference. So what do you do instead? You do what's called calibration. There's many um, facets to this. I'm just gonna say it in a reduced form way is calibration means you have some external or, or model relevant information. That would be the SAM or you have estimates from the literature on parameter values. And you use these to quantify the model and your goal in this has been turned around from the viewpoint of classical econometrics. You're not inferring on parameter values, but you, you're, you're, you're fixing parameter values and trying to see how's your model doing. 
Okay, so it's actually a procedure that that when it was in, conceived, it, it, it's justified more from the point of model development than estimation. Right, it's exactly what you do if you don't know what is the right model, but try to get somewhere. And this is the stage where almost all macro is. There's also another thing I want to say here regarding the parameterization. It's important for validation of these kind of models is ex ante policy analysis is not forecasting. Yeah, and some people can confuse this. Uh, forecasting requires you, a good model would need to take into account everything that changes in the future that you want to forecast. It, it would need to take a stand on all shocks that might Im impede on the economy in the future, right? Policy analysis is luckily less ambitious than that. Um, it says, I, I want to have a baseline maybe for the future and a counterfactual, but I'm holding everything else constant. So if I do a policy, ex ante policy analysis in the beginning of 2020, I did not need to think about the possibility of a pandemic happening, right? So, um, so it's easier in a sense, but we should, we should not require from policy analysis, we don't need to require that it's able to forecast the evolution. It's, it's like a, it's trying to uh, get at a partial derivative of what happens in the future, the changes happening according to the policy change, not a total differential in terms of everything that changes in the future, okay? But that, that makes it easier for us in a sense, but there's one drawback in this. It means that if we think about model validation, again, the classic econometrician me would think, okay, I build a model of something, I calibrate it or using historical data or maybe even estimate it using historical data. And then if I wanna validate my model, I, I would try to see what it projects for the future where I haven't estimated that on data that I haven't used to estimate it. Okay. Uh, variants of this are forecasting historical decompositions where you try to see is my model realistic in the sense of telling me something about the evolution of historical data. Now, because um, the models are not really designed for that, we, we often, some do, but cannot do this kind of model validation and instead do something else that you've all also seen in Zoyana's talk is we do robustness checks, sensitivity analyses <coughs> with respect to model assumptions. So closure rules, basically what, what, what is uh, modeled in an exogenous kind of way, for example, savings rates, functional form assumptions, factor specificity, and so on. Yeah, all these assumptions we put into the model, we can in principle check what would happen if we had alternative assumptions. And then even given those assumptions, um, given that we calibrate, we stick in one parameter value for all these things, we can see what happens when we change the parameter values one by one called piecemeal or systematic, change them all in at the same time according to some distribution. And then there's stuff that's more specific to the CGE uh, data reconciliation assumptions as I'm experiencing. Um, we have to make some adjustments to the SAM data, right? And if you go into micro um, uh, simulation, which I'll talk about a little bit, is then you have to do more assumptions about how to reconcile data from different data sets. And you would could do a sensitivity analysis here. Yeah, so that's an extremely important integral part of what we do. And the tough part is communicating uh, the results of such a sensitivity analysis. Um, how, um, how much, Amanda, how much time do I have? <laughs> okay, uh, I, was, I was about to interrupt you. Uh, so you have uh, about 15 minutes. Okay, sorry, so I'll go quick. So, um, sorry. Um, so there's, um, in, in macro, what are other strands of the literature? Quantitative theory strands, growth, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, what's called heterogeneous agent models. This is about, you've probably heard the solo model. This comes from real business cycle literature and looks at monetary and fiscal policy in a stochastic setting with price rigidities, for example. 
Heterogeneous agent models look at the incompleteness of markets and how people, for example, self-insure in order to take care of risks that they perceive in the future, but there's no insurance markets available. Then there's a macro labor literature that looks specifically at interaction on labor markets apart from perfect competition called search model. I would also um, add to this overlapping generations framework where you can look at issues about pension systems and models of that try to understand taxation systems and how they influence the evolution of the economy, for example, capital taxation. Then there's CGE. And then there's more, which I know much less about, trade and regional gravity models and models of firm dynamics, which also have an uh, equilibrium and thus macro perspective. But my aim here is trying to, to, to see where this all, all, all this is going, because I, it's, it's kind of weird that we have all these different frameworks trying to answer often very similar questions. So then what are the strengths of computational equilibrium models uh, in, in, this, in this literature? Like Zoyana said, quantifying effects of policy proposals on disaggregate units, ind industries, regions, socioeconomic groups in a micro-founded equilibrium setting. Well, that's what the other strands of the literature do too, in terms of micro-founded setting, but they don't do the disaggregated effects. And these disaggregated structures and effects, they allow a detailed representation of institutional features and the production structure of an economy, which the other models usually don't do at all, okay? At the same time, that means that you can look at detailed, realistic specification of policy proposals, which the other models can't do. Together then, you have, a like others do, but differently, a consistent calibration strategy. You, you have all seen it with the SAM. And so the, the areas of replications of CGE are exactly the areas where these things are important, climate, yeah, trade, fiscal policies, um, to a lesser extent, but also very important, questions of where the government allocates its expenditure, infrastructure, education, health, and what that does in the economy. Then you have multiple single country, regional CGE models. My thinking is more in the single, single country. So these are the strengths. What are the weaknesses? Complexity is its weakness. Many structural assumptions that you need to make, many parameters you need to calibrate with very limited information and inherent in this whole quantitative theory is its limits as an empirical strategy, meaning you get numbers out, but you don't get confidence bands about these numbers, okay? You can do robustness and sensitivity, but, and this is not just CGE, okay? It's almost all quantitative theory. It's really hard to get confidence intervals about uh, the effects that you are estimating using your model. There's, there's stark simplifications, even though, I mean, it's trying to deal with complexity and needs to, at some point, make very stark simplifications in some dimensions. In my view, coming from other areas of macro, it's the focus on the real side of economy. I cannot talk about monetary policy, right? But I don't have to, but if I do, then I, it's hard for me to do in this class of models. So some of the closures that you've probably learned in this course, macro closures on the savings investment side or the um, incorporation of an open economy, um, they're rather ad hoc. They, they could, you could say that they may violate the Lucas critique. Um, and then, as I said before, usually, at least to my knowledge, there, there's no uncertainty in these models. So there's no shock processes in the future that people react to the possibility of having these shocks. It's deterministic. And uh, the equilibrium concepts are often simple or have the benchmark of perfect competition, although, of course, there's deviations from this. Adding to the injury to insult is for some questions, there's still too much aggregation. So I'm telling you it's too complex, but it's too simple at the same time. So, I mean, this is a real trade-off of the literature is trying to get that right, uh, this trade-off. And for this, you always need to keep in mind, what is the policy question? And what kind of complexity do I, do I need for this? Luckily, in the past couple of years, things are converging in terms of the macro literature. 
the non-CGE macro is much more interested now, nowadays in, in disaggregated phenomena. That has to do with advances in computation, data availability. It has to do with the insight that distributional effects matter not only in themselves for understanding who gets what, but they matter for the aggregate effects as well, okay? So if you have many poor, some rich, many poor, this matters for how the aggregate economy behaves. So that's an argument for not being able to really separate the two. On the other side, coming from the micro side, partial equilibrium models, there's been a lot of progress in terms of data, but also econometric methods and models in, in analyzing uh, deep structural models of heterogeneous choices of stuff like labor supply in view of a very finely delineated tax system. Yeah, so the labor supply models on the household side, there's just been a lot of development. And these things, like this bottom up, I already call it bottom up and top down, they are converging. And I, in my view, the platform where they rightly converge is the CGE platform. That's why I am interested in working with it or learning more about it. Now, I wanna mention a couple of things here, which I, which I find especially interesting. Um, the, one is the aspect of dynamics. The other is the aspect of labor markets. And the last one is micro simulation. So many CGE models are static or comparative, or they compare steady states. But a lot of application require or want you to look at transitions and dynamic perspectives. What happens, for example, with pension systems? This can be in terms of factor accumulation or mobility of factors which are specific in the short term between different industries, for example. You could also think about endogenizing, explaining demographic change. You, could, you can think, and people do, about endogenizing technological change. The ways to incorporate this, and you probably have seen this in some of your lectures in your education, think about a growth model. The first growth model we learn is called the solo growth model, where you have an exogenous savings rate, and then you can solve everything forward. This is what the most common approach does in the CGE literature, it's called recursive dynamic. Basically, it's a, it's a specification of the forward links of the savings rate. It doesn't have a micro foundation, although the saving rate might depend in a pre-specified way on certain parameters, such as the interest rate or demographic change. Um, the, the rest of the macro literature, the much more aggregated macro literature is using um, optimizing behavior to understand savings decisions. It's forward looking in this sense, okay? In the context of without uncertainty, this is called perfect foresight. So basically, and, and this can be integrated into CGE. There's a model called G cubed uh, that does this, um, okay? And other, other people, uh, Dale Jorgensen at Harvard are doing things like this. So, so what you can do in CGE, uh, and this relates to DSGE, is uh, you have, you, you divide the household problem into some problems. One has to do with the intertemporal choice of, for example, capital accumulation. And you make a bunch of assumptions that macroeconomists in this area always make separability of utility. And then you have uh, other choices like labor supply or allocation of consumption between different good types, which are within each period. And hence you kind of, it's called maximizing out. You have an intertemporal and an intratemporal aspect um, of your model. This can be done e either in an infinite horizon setting where people live forever, it's the simplest one, or an overlapping generations life cycle structure, okay? N the computation of this is tough and the devils are in the detail, as we say in German at least, the devil is in the detail, but um, you would go about by determining a steady state. You basically have from your solution of your intertemporal problem, you have a, uh, a difference equation or a differential equation um, called the Euler equation. And uh, an algorithm would try to call the shooting algorithm most commonly used is would, would try to see, okay, what is the level of consumption or saving people choose today optimally? And from this Euler equation, you would feed that forward and see if you actually converge to the steady state. 
It's basically a boundary problem with two sets of boundaries. One is the steady state where you're going to, the other one is the initial conditions where you're coming from with a difference equation in between. Yeah, so that can be done. Once you've done that, because of this maximizing out, you can solve for the intertemporal quantities and prices. Okay. Now, as I said before, generally this means just the dynamic setting, your baseline scenario uh, where you're doing the counterfactual against needs, is also model inherent. Okay. And of course, you need many more parameters, data assumptions, especially if you think about the much more interesting overlapping generations framework. We have profiles of how much people earn over their life cycle, for example. When do they retire? Yeah, how, how do they leave their bequests? So of course you can do this, but you buy it with a lot more necessity to uh, calibrate more parameters and computational um, difficulties. Okay, let me skip just to the outlook here in terms of the dynamic. So I think there's a lot that can be integrated or learned from other literatures in the CGE setting. Um, I think the biggest kind of construction site is how to deal with uncertainty and people's reactions to it. Yeah, if you, and of course, this is only relevant for certain policy questions, but the ones I think about and want to think of or think about in CGE context as well, labor market policies, health policies, pension systems, these things almost always have an insurance component. So I need to think about uncertainty. The other part is, if we think about macro policy, we need to think about a nominal side of the economy, nominal rigidity, so-called new Keynesian models. And um, that's, I think, something where uh, a lot of stuff can be added to CGE. Let me just quickly, I'm totally running out of time, right? Quickly add something to two, th two more things, labor markets. In the simplest setting, labor is exogenous. Labor demand, labor supply is exogenous. Labor demand is perfectly substitutable between types in the simplest settings. And in the simplest setting, the coordination between supply and demand is perfectly competitive. The, these features might not be right and they might not be amenable to answer certain policy questions, especially about labor market policies, labor income taxation, if you have skill bias, technological change or so on. So what I think the biggest thing to think about here is the um, coordination side, okay? So um, deviations from perfect competition. First, you need to think about what, how many labor markets do I have? Yeah, are, in what way are they segmented or differentiated? But then you need to think about how are wages determined? And uh, from the macro labor literature, there's three structural ways of thinking about deviations from perfect competition, which have at least to some extent been implemented. Search and matching, collective bargaining, efficiency wages. I work mostly on this, and depending on the economy and institutional settings. So this is about frictions in the labor market. This is about trade unions. This is about productivity or effort being influenced by wage setting. So I think, this, especially, but that's my perspective, this is a promising avenue, but it has its difficulties of integrating a better representation of labor markets. Yeah, so in terms of the labor market, I think what the outlook and what we can take from other literature is mostly about structural models of the form of coordination and integration of imperfect competition. And also in terms of linking to dynamics before, Unemployment is a state variable. It doesn't jump, it moves over time. People enter and leave unemployment. People take time to migrate between sectors, informal and formal. Yeah, so that's actually something where dynamics play an important role. And one of the big difficulties I'm gonna uh, discuss in my next last point is mapping microeconomic estimates and structural parameters. So, if you have a lot of differentiated labor types and households with many kids, one, one main earner, two main earners, uh, then uh, you have all these micro estimates that give you good ideas of elasticities on these particular households, but aggregating them to the macro elasticity where you have representative households is hard. This is exactly what micro simulation links to CGE is about. You need to account for heterogeneity, two motivations, one, we saw this in Zoyana's talk as well, is the interest in distributional effects. The other is that policies themselves you're analyzing 
might have very disaggregated impacts on individuals. Yeah, not how much child benefit support you get in your tax system. Yeah, all this depends on individual characteristics. So it's very disaggregated. And the last thing, consistency. You have, this is about calibration. You have microeconomic uh, literature on the estimation of very specific labor supply elasticities for very specific demographic groups, men, women, so on. Okay, to make, you, in your macro model, you usually don't have this, but you need to make them consistent with what you have as estimates from the micro side. So what are the kind of strategies here? You have your CGE model, you have a micro model, okay? Usually a discrete choice model of labor supply, for example. I'm thinking about this example of labor supply. And you have possible links between these two. And even before you establish these links, oh, there's more data consistency issue. What, what is measured in the underlying household survey data? Is it consistent with what you see in the SAM? Yeah, are these linkings consistent? This is highly aggregated. You need to aggregate it in a consistent way and feed it onto the micro side. Um, and now there's three ways to proceed in these links. One is relatively simple called top-down. I'm just gonna, I'm, there's some more slides on this, but I'm running out of time. So one is simple accounting. You hold the micro behavior fixed and feed the price changes from the CGE to the micro side and see what comes out. Um, the next is uh, top-down micro simulation. This is what Zoyana had in one of her papers. You have a model on the micro side, how people react. You feed the price changes from the macro side here, see how people in individual disaggregated household groups react. And then you do some consistency adjustment so that the aggregates coming out of this are consistent with the macro side. Yeah, and this allows you to learn more about distributional effects. Two minutes, one minute, okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Then there's the bottom up perspective. It's you use information from the micro side. This might even be about elasticities, particular household groups. This might be about uh, features, very specific features of the tax and transfer system. They use them to calibrate, generate artificial data in a sense to calibrate their CGE model parameters, which are much more aggregated. Okay. And now there's a really cool thing called an iterative procedure, but it doesn't always work. It's you uh, generate prices, price changes in your CGE model, feed them to the micro model, see what the micro behavior implies in terms of quantities, and then <laughs> different ways, but one way is to make the quantities consistent with what you have in the CGE model. You basically, you can, one way is to recalibrate the parameters of the CGE part of the model on the household side in order to be consistent with those quantities given the observe the price changes. And then you iterate on this and hope it converges, okay? So this is, I think, where a lot of the literature there is going to sum up. Um, there's stark trade-offs in what a model can focus on. Always have to think about what is the policy question what data is available? What information can I use in the first place? And in conjunction with that data, what mechanisms are amenable to consistent micro foundations? If I make very ad hoc assumptions on something, a mechanism that's central to the model, it's gonna be criticized on that dimension, right? That I need it to satisfy the Lucas critique in its important dimension. And some important to-dos in the CG literature. As I said, dynamics and uncertainty, in conjunction with that, asset markets, insurance, financial markets, labor market coordination, at least for the questions, not, I mean, obviously not for trade, but for my questions about labor, uh, labor market income taxation, labor market coordination is very important. And, and one thing um, is this whole micro simulation thing, you can think about that integration, not only on the household side, but on the firm side. And then you open up another box of really interesting dynamics that you have on the part of firms, right? Uh, which firms, how big do firms get? Uh, when do firms exit? How many enter, how many exit? What kind of productivity do they have? So there's a lot of stuff there as well. And lastly, keep in mind that 
in the end, if the model is super cool, what we want to do with it is not analyze one policy proposal, but we want to find out what's the best possible policy uh, in a given restricted set of policies. All right, thank you very much. Do you have time for questions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, there is uh, one question uh, in the mm -hmm. Q&A, uh, but it's uh, the question are addressed to Soriana, so I will okay. uh, give the time to Soriana, but if the uh, participant have question for uh, Helge, uh, the participant can type in the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was a very, very, very good uh general description you know i, I enjoyed uh, listening to you as well <laughs> a lot Thank you. and actually Thank you have you. already already re responded uh, somehow to the question that are um, in the q a chat um first of all um the question regarding um the dynamics uh, example how can we be sure that our simulation is closed uh, probably you mean up to 2030 right um how can we measure deviations of our predictions um I don't understand what exactly you mean with that. Um, as we know that GDAP and IO datas, the data sets in several countries have different periods. Yeah, uh, so to start with the first question, how can we be sure we cannot? That's easy to, <laughs> to say, because uh, that's a trade off actually what Hege was just mentioning um, between static and, and dynamic models, right? So if you have a stand, static model, um, you have their closures, what, what you also have in, in, in the second uh, questions. Um, I think it's better because then you can comp uh, compare two steady states. First, you assume that you're starting in a steady state, which is also not always the case, right? In our real world. And then if you have the closure where you allow capital to adjust you kind of move to another steady state and there you might be more or less sure that you are in new equilibrium, but still uh, only according to that one shock, the, the only one that you have as a policy uh, variable, right? If you take the dynamic models, just like Helga already said, you have much more assumptions about the development all over the time, right? So, and if you use forecasts for your development, the, conf the, the, the uh, interval, um, confidential interval, right? It's, 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 it spreads, it's, it's wider and wider, the longer you use your forecast. So you're not sure about your even baseline, right? The, the more in the future you go, you can run it even longer than 2030, you can run it 20, 2050, 20, whatever you want. But um, I'm not sure that those results will, will be reliable because all of the forecasts, they have their assumptions and they're not that reliable in that sense so that's that's the question what you do if you do need the dynamics you have to have a dynamic model but you cannot be sure that the simulation kind of the the, the adjustment is completely over right um regarding the data well uh talking about gtab data that's why i was saying if, if you're um kind of interested in one uh, economy it's better to take um national data and create and the model because the GDAP data set has data from G different um, years for different countries, and it has to make it consistent, right? So that's the problem that we have. And they have a number of procedures. They have also literature, how a description, how they do it, how they force the data to be consistent. And what I can say even more, um, as I was working on Ukraine, um, I just want to know how different the, the data might be. And I compared just the benchmark data from that I had and, and the GTAP data, and they their main focus is on trade. So they try to keep trade links as they are in the data and then try to adjust the rest so it's consistent with those trade. And that comes on the effect that in some sectors, production structure might change in comparison to that what you see in the national data. So that's what I had, especially in chemical industries as an example. So one have to be cautious. And just one correction, uh, I have just checked for Ukraine, the latest available um, IO table is now for 2018, but um, you need to think about all of the other data sources. So I think we choose uh, later one because we didn't have data for some other source in, in, in different prices, because you do need different prices. So you have, 
well, I, I don't want to get into that and how you construct, but that's what I'm saying. Even if some data sources are from for, available from one year and others might be available for older years, then you have to decide what you're going to do, right? To make it consistent. And regarding the closures, also, I think that Helga has also re responded to that question more or less. I just say, uh, you, are, you cannot be always sure because you do have to assume something and you try to choose your assumptions in your model along the research question, right? So you try to pick the best closures that are um, necessary for uh, to respond this um, question. And um, I would say in that case, if you're not sure, then you should do some robustness checks again um, and try something different, right? And then you can see how sensitive your outcomes are with regard to different closures and, and what that would mean for your final uh, um, conclusion, right? Um, yeah, there is okay. another one, but to you, Helga. Uh, wait, uh, before that, I think there is one person who would like to ask the question directly. So to Mr. Ahmad Yassin, uh, the opportunity to ask the question uh, is yours. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask your question. And then I will help uh, to translate the question for Helge. <laughs> okay. Pa Ahmad Yassin, uh, you can ask your question. Uh, sorry, there is no a question. <laughs> oh, okay, then. Uh, we will get back to the Q&A. Um, let me uh, try to translate the question for Helge. And then the question is, uh, based on your explanation, uh, you said that CGE uh, is useful when we want to examine a uh, change uh, in one sector, but what if the change uh, happen in the most of the sector in the economy? Uh, do you think CGE can still uh, work for that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think um, one issue, okay, so first, if you think about closed economies, where I do most of my work, okay, I think when you think about open economies and trade, it, it gets much more complicated. But think about closed economies, I, I do think there's a couple of, there's some questions that can be answered um, using single sector models that don't have a materials structure input output table behind them. In fact, as I said earlier, when I did the study for the minimum wage in, in Germany, which was a structural model, it, it had a lot of detail on the labor market side. This labor market coordination was a search model, but it didn't have, uh, it just had an exemplary sectoral structure to show what would happen to price indices when you have uh, different skills affected differently by the wage. Yeah, so um, I think it's definitely something to think about is reducing the size of sectors uh, if it helps you add detail on another important side. Um, but, but again, this is a judgment, unfortunately, of the researcher. What it sometimes means and what it's difficult for me right now in the, in the position is you have to switch between modeling environments, right? Okay, so something might be done in a macro lab, standard macro labor search model that doesn't have a sectoral structure and something else within the CGE. And um, bridging these, building the bridge between the two is what's tough because there's a lot of computational issues that are specific to each modeling environment. But I definitely think there's questions where one sector structure is enough. Okay, uh, there is one more question, and this is a rather long one. Uh, I will try to summarize it uh, as best uh, I could. So basically, uh, in this question, uh, Pak Imran Roshadi uh, said that, what if there are two types of policy, like for example, monetary policy and fiscal policy? So each of the policy have their own uh, goal, and uh, they have different goals, right? So. Uh, uh, how the interaction of those two different policy can help uh, to achieve the social welfare. And then um, how do we uh, formulate a policy that can uh, be objective 
and rational, especially in the extraordinary situation like the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, uh, and what kind of model that can be suitable uh, to examine uh, the effect of those uh, policy? Uh, more or less, that's the question. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, th these, are, these are questions more suitable for a DSGE framework, especially if you think what we mean by uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy are macroeconomic policies. Um, whose effect have a lot to do with the modeling of price uh, rigidities or wage rigidities. The framework for this, the so-called new Keynesian framework is highly aggregated. It doesn't have the sectoral structure, but it anal can analyze um, monetary and fiscal policy, how they interact and even how to optimally try to design them in order to react to shocks. Yeah, so this is a question about dynamics. It's a question about short-term dynamics with nominal rigidities. Um, the pandemic question is a question about dynamics, not necessarily about short-term rigidities. I would think at the first pass, both of these types, there is a, a bridge being built to CGE modeling. This is the G-cubed model, McKibben, uh, but I can, um, to send me an email, provide uh, some of the literature that are trying to address these things on not really on the, they have a monetary, de, um, monetary perfect foresight dynamic model. It can be, you can start to use it to think about monetary policy, but it's really um, going to be tough because it doesn't have any stochastics in it. Interestingly, this class of paper, the class of models, they actually did look at pandemics back in the SARS, after the SARS pandemic, uh, to try to build a dynamic CGE model, it's perfect foresight, and understand the impacts uh, of pandemics. Um, my honest, and I'm not too, I mean, I, it's a huge literature, right, the whole thing, but my impression is, once you try to get into the details of how this model actually works, I have not found very good documentation. There's a chapter in the handbook of computational economics from 2013 by McKibben on this class of model G cubed. So you might want to look into that. That's the best place to start. Okay. Uh, so, Yep, uh, I think we have uh, answered all of the question. And uh, I think we also have already running out of time. <laughs> okay, so uh, I will close uh, this session and I want to appreciate um, everyone's time here. Thank you for Helge. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Zoriana. And thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen who have come and joined this session. Uh, this was a really awesome session, I think, and the longest one uh, we have so far. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not your fault. It's because we are so excited to have uh, you guys here. And this is the last session. So that was great that we can uh, get a perspective other than from uh, Indonesia. So um, again, uh, I want to say thank you. And then um, uh, goodbye uh, for everyone. And uh, good night, because this is already a night in Indonesia. <laughs> And then uh, have a good weekend and we'll see you in the next uh, Sinarku webinar session. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thanks much, so much. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.